Since 1979, Nick Cave has challenged, infuriated, inspired, and been a lesson to a growing cult of fans and of recent bandwagoners who seem to see a 64-year-old exoriously married father of four as some kind of icon of rebellion or counterculture. To longer-term observers, he is a man whose art has seen him surmount addiction, heartbreak, the death of his father, his son, and the first woman he's ever loved, yet steers an honest course, oblivious to fashion, guided only by three supreme beliefs, the redemptive power of love, the transformative power of art, and the liberating power of free expression. Nick Cave was a country boy born in Warwicknabeel, Victoria in 1957. Despite his peregrinations around the world, he has still retained his Australian accent. His father was passionate about literature and encouraged Nick to read modern poets and authors. Nick was also infatuated with the legend of Ned Kelly, considered by some to be an iconic Australian hero, but considered by your humble narrator to be little more than a thief, kidnapper, murderer and terrorist. Judging by the bad men and women who were to populate Cave's later songs, he seemed to successfully reconcile the two cognitively dissonant points of view. Shortly after Nick's expulsion from high school at age 13, the family relocated to Murrumbina, a suburb of Melbourne with a long history as an artist on clay. Nick was enrolled in the prestigious Caulfield Grammar School where he formed his first band, The Boys Next Door, along with longtime collaborators Mick Harvey and Tracy Pugh. He later studied art, but after seeing legendary Australian punk bands Radio Birdman and The Saints, dropped out for a year to pursue music and it would seem heroin. A year after dropping out of art school, Cave was arrested for burglary and held at the St Kilda police station. As his mother arrived to bail him out, a police constable pulled them aside. Cave's father had been killed in a car wreck that very morning. It was, as Cave puts it in one of the rare statements he's made on the matter, the defining moment of his life. The story of the boys next door, who renamed themselves as the birthday party when they relocated in 1980 to London, and later West Berlin as the most violent band in the world and the One Band Army, as famous for their fistfights on stage with the audience as they were for their fistfights on stage with one another, or their frequently playing with its members passed out on stage from drink or heroin, is another slightly hilarious, slightly sad one. Anyway, it's in the work of the birthday party that the diverse elements of lounge jazz, gospel, German cabaret, a apocalyptic vision and southern gothic started to blend and form the sound of Cave's next band, The Bad Seeds. And this is where our story begins, with the 17 studio albums by Cave and The Bad Seeds, plus his lone 2021 collaboration with Warren Ellis. No live albums, soundtracks or compilations, just the very difficult task of grading and ranking both on their artfulness and their impact on my life at the time. Spirited discussion is encouraged. 18. Murder Ballads from 1996 Despite providing Cave with a number two hit single via his duet with Kylie Minogue, the near preternatural loveliness, on Where the Wild Roses Grow, Murder Ballads is largely an embarrassment to Cave. Instead of plundering the child ballads or the route index and finding authentic murder ballads to contemporise, Cave serves up a selection of witless, if cleverly rhymed, gore fests, plus a dreary version of Bob Dylan's Death Is Not The End. Only the operatically bloodthirsty take on Stagger Lee, the perennial set closer encore I have seen him close with Into My Arms, which caused a near riot, rises above the risible. 17. Abattoir Blues, The Liar of Orpheus from 2004. At some point around the turn of the century, Nick got the idea that the world needed a new Michael Hutchins, and he was just the man for the job. The outcome of this was this double album, and to some extent the preceding Nocturama. Its chief fault is that despite that conceit, the album just doesn't have very many good songs on it. Number 16, Nocturama from 2003. Nocturama is the most popular target for the fan base's ire. It is considered a passage of honour to criticise the record and, while it's no great shakes as an album, it's nowhere near as dire as Abattoir Blues and has some songs that would have warranted consideration for, say, The Boatman's Call. It's also a better, luscious sounding record than its successor. Fortunately, Cave's side hustle grinder man would snap him out of the slough that took up the early 2000s. 15. The Good Son from 1990 the ship song is, in my opinion, the best song Cave has ever written, but there just isn't enough here to back it up on this album, where some sketchy production and a tendency to drop into Berlin cabaret tropes dominates. 
a wasted opportunity from a time in Cave's life when he was balancing the poles of a new wife, a realignment of his lyrical focus from the Old Testament to the New, and the degrading experience of what he called the dehumanizing rehab and the inevitable lapse back heavier than ever into heroin. Number 14, No More Shall We Part from 2001. Cave married Susie Bick in 1999 and finally quit his heroin habit in 2001. No More Shall We Part details the untangling of his past, his debts in the present, and his thinly dawning optimism for the future. Quiet, reflective, occasionally humorous, the album's tone is so unvarying it makes it hard for anything to stand out. There are some major pieces here, as I sat sadly by her side and darker with the day, as well as the crude but effective metaphor of 15 feet of pure white snow. This is quality record making and quality songwriting, but it fails to achieve the benchmark of a superior album. It cannot transcend the sum of its parts. Number 13, Tender Prey from 1988. The last salvo of Cave's primitive period, the Bad Seeds by this point are a formidable band and Cave's vision itself is tempered from its ink-black southern gothic as expressed in the brilliant opening volley of the Mercy Seat, Up Jump the Devil and Deanna to a more poetic, observational narrative such as Sunday's Slave. It's not perfect, but it did set a platform for Cave to move into the early to mid-90s as a maturing songwriter and perhaps the most unlikely pop star of the decade. Number 12, Your Funeral, My Trial from 1986. The band's fourth album is a triumph of Cave's songwriting, but an indictment of his editorial policy. Few albums have been as unremittingly bleak and brutal in their dissection of almost superhuman frailties. While it's understood that Cave as the artist has the prerogative to construct albums like this as he pleases, in terms of leaving it as a legacy recording, he hasn't really given it enough textural variety, either musically or from his lyrical viewpoint. There are some great songs here, the title track, the Carney, Sad Waters, Stranger Than Kindness, and it's those songs that differentiate this album from the then burgeoning goth movement, which the birthday party had helped to kickstart. Number 11, Kicking Against the Pricks from 1986. A bold move for a third album, Kicking Against the Pricks is a collection of cover songs which, especially on side one, one feels Cave could have done a little better with, but is redeemed by excellent interpretations of By the Time I Get to Phoenix, The Singer, and Three Slammers to Close. A chilling take on Gene Pitney's Something's Gotten Hold of My Heart, a rousing go at the Alabama singer's Jesus Met the Woman at the Well, and a stunning version of The Carnival Is Over a song written by Dusty Springfield's brother Tom. Carnival is for me one of the true highlights of Cave's canon, and the first moment he truly shows his metal as an interpretive vocalist. While First Born Is Dead made me a fan, this is the record that made me an admirer, and it means a great deal to me personally. Let Love In from 1994. Every great artist with an extended catalogue has an underrated record in their collection, one that is at its time popular but then begins to get lost in the shuffle. In Nick Cave's case, it's Let Love In, which went a long way towards legitimising Cave as something beyond the Southern Gothic freak show that songs like The Mercy Seat or Papa Won't Leave You Henry cast him as. While still a transformational record, notions of empathy and the personal voice of Ended Caves, as have the human frailties, not as despised weaknesses to be mocked and degraded within the song. Standout tracks include I Let Love In, Do You Love Me, Ain't Gonna Rain Anymore, and The Extraordinary Nobody's Baby Now and Lay Me Low, as well as fans' favourite, the thoroughly overplayed Red Right Hand, Jangling Jack, and The Thirsty Dog, the latter two which harken back the previous version of the Bad Seeds. But despite its promise and delivery, Let Love In remains slightly forgotten as a record in this catalogue, a situation which deserves immediate redress. Number 9, Dig Lazarus Dig from 2008. After the saucy fun of Grinderman, Dig Lazarus Dig sounds almost like a party album where Cave's cocksure swagger and the band's live in the studio sound give the music an energy it hadn't really had since the noisier moments of Tender Prey. Recorded in five days and sounding like it, the album veers between a nightmare fever dream and gutter snipe cock rocking with a frantic energy and a mysterious inner spirit. The highlights, the Charles Manson meets Nikos Kazantakis monochord grind of the title track, Today's lesson with a bass line that could have been played by Tracy Pugh in the birthday party, 
the quieter but nonetheless disturbing trio of Moonland, Night of the Lotus Eaters and Albert Goes West, the droll we call upon the author, the starkly poetic lie down here in Be My Girl, which is possibly the best song on the album, and the concluding dryly observed villainalia, More News From Nowhere. However you slice us, this has to date been the last recognisable rock album Cave has released, and if that is to be, then he's chosen a grand one to finish with. Anyone looking for an enjoyable first step down the road of Nick Cave, this comes highly recommended as a starting point. Number 8, From Her to Eternity, 1984. The band Seed's debut is a refinement of certain elements from the birthday party, but sacrifices the more anarchic ones for a brooding, krautrock-esque pulse, depraved cabaret and the ghost of Scott Walker's sonic soundscaping. Filled with the then typical cave tropes of unquenchable flames of base human desires, terror of God, southern mythology most explicit on St. Huck, and psychosexual cruelty. This music is taut and unpredictable and plays often theatrically, framing Cave's performance more than propelling it. It opens with Leonard Cohen's Avalanche, a song Cave seems to utterly inhabit in all its mocking brutality. Cabin Fever is also an excellent grim story with its image of A-N-I-T-A -A, wriggling free on a skull and dagger at its centre, although it lacks the allegorical power he was to develop in a song like The Carney a few albums later. Well of Misery, Wings Off Flies and the title track, which was Stemmy's set list the last time I saw him in 2017 are all excellent and St. Huck, another highlight, opened his set in 1985, the first time I saw him. The album is also better in its reissue configuration, which includes The Moon Is In The Gutter and his remarkable cover of In The Ghetto. Number 7, Carnage from 2021. Cave's most recent album, and his first without the band Seeds for 37 years, sees him working with Warren Ellis on what was the most difficult album in this collection to assess. Suffice to say that it is excellent, in places compelling and breathtaking, but on the other hand, one feels one has to live inside this album to fully appreciate it, to hear it all and be informed by it all, but also thinks, unlike the purifying ghost scene, the world of this album is not one one would want to live in. To use a crude analogy, the album takes a lo-fi and free-ranging musical sweep of Skeleton Tree and applies it to a song basis similar to those of No More Shall We Part. It's a record of currents and undercurrent, set against a world that takes Cave a long time to find his place in, tenuous as that might be. For an artist who's been chronicling the impact of loss and grief, but also of bewilderness and loneliness for many years, Carnage comes at the now crucial confluence of these points. It's highlighted by a shifting perspective, Cave moving further from an interventionist god to god as a remote and a distant figure, while retaining his images of kingdoms and kingships, which has dominated at his writing from the very beginning and a belief in the redemptive power of love. At first this belief is tenuous and ephemeral as the wall of grief that surrounds him and those he loves is so impermeable. By the end of the album he sees love as the thin light on the horizon that he must work towards. As with Ghostine and Skeleton Key, Cave had abandoned his usual narrative style for a symbolic and introspective style, and the songs, the internal monologues that are swept by, are remarkable, and there is not a song on this you do not want to hear, particularly the last five. The outstanding White Elephant, Albuquerque, Lavender Fields, Shattered Ground, and the beautiful Balcony Man. Were I to do this list again in a year, I have little doubt I'd make this number one. Just be warned that it does take a deal of time to inhabit. Number six, Henry's Dream from 1992. An excellent record and possibly the one that old school cave fans most immediately gravitate towards. This is the Nick Cave that murder ballads killed, the demonic whiskey preacher railing against depravity, it's sponsoring at every turn. Still with time to write songs as exquisite as Straight To You. Full of colourful songs and unforgettable characters, the title track rips the record open from the first line and bears its guts hot and bloody for the running time of the album. The opening track, Papa Won't Leave You Henry, takes us into the world where Cave seeks to transcend by blood or grace, with its images of entire towns being washed away. 
favelas exploding on inflammable spillways, lynch mobs, death squads, babies being born without brains, mad heat and relentless rains. That imagery, especially that of heat and unceasing rain, is closely associated with the town of Yucalor in Cave's 1989 I-Dialect novel and the Ass Saw the Angel. The theme of Cave's gothic fantasy world being invaded by carpetbaggers continues in the frantic I Had a Dream Joe where the image of a cheap seersucker suit both tempts and waterfies Cave's world. The stately and magnificent straight to you with its images of thunderbolts and sparks is perhaps my favourite of all cave songs and one that should have been a huge hit. It made number 96 in Australia. When I First Came to Town is another song of isolation, outsiderliness, rejection and the hope of redemption. The sole weak spot on the album is John Finn's Wife, which too blatantly retreads old and recent themes and is more than a little comical for it. Cave was very unhappy with David Briggs's production here, feeling his use of the same approach he used with Neil Young was unsympathetic to the material, and set about remixing it with Mick Harvey as soon as Briggs signed off. Henry's dream, for all its faults real and imagined, is still the perfect entry point for the fan who wants to understand, but not be overwhelmed by the mythos of Nick Cave. Number 5. The Boatman's Call Often called, much to Cave's annoyance, his blood on the tracks, any time spent with this record will quickly dispel such notions. It represents the final departure from the old Bad Seeds model, turning a sombre or romantic disposition. There are many great songs on the record, his beloved Into My Arms, the completely non-ironic People Ain't No Good, There Is A Kingdom, and The Glorious Are You The One That I've Been Waiting For, as well as Idiot Prayer and Far From Me. The beautiful and moving Brompton Oratory dominates the record, the moral rock on which the collection of songs rests. Whereas Blood on the Tracks is about the assumption of various personal mythologies, Boatman's Call is about painfully shedding them, the untying of myth, the inexorability of change and arrival, not travelling down the road heading for another joint. A lot of people's favourite album of his, and one that is certainly special to me. Number 4, Ghostine from 2019. Imagine the Kubler-Ross model of grief and loss expressed musically. In doing that, consider Skeleton Key is shock, Carnage is anger and perhaps acceptance, and Ghostine is torpor and bargaining. But it stands as an amazing testament to Cave's lyrical power, especially the opening verse to Bright Horses, which is one of the most movingly beautiful pieces in his or anyone's catalogue, as it retains the departed spirit of Cave's lost son Arthur. Let us not dwell on the tawdry circumstances of his death. The bright horses have broken free from the fields. They are horses of love, their manes full of fire. They are parting the city, those bright burning horses. And everyone is hiding, no one makes a sound. And I'm by your side and I'm holding your hand. Bright horses of wonder springing from your burning hand. And the title track involves oceanic levels of sadness, but ends on Cave's attempt to strike a bargain with Ghostine. The suffix Ean is an Irish term for spirit or sprite that associated with a craftsman. And the pact that neither will leave the other. Three bears watch the TV, they age a lifetime, O oh Lord. Mama Bear holds the remote, Papa Bear he just floats, and Baby Bear is gone, gone to the moon in a boat. Beautiful, artful, harrowingly sad, Ghostine is an album like few others. Number 3, Push the Sky Away from 2013. The entire nature of the catalogue was changed with 2013's Push the Sky Away, where Cave took his narrative-based songwriting and put it in the hands of Nick Lornay and Warren Ellis, who deconstructed the Bad Seed sounds to a series of electronic sweeps and rushes, and forced Cave to assume a new and more powerful authority to his vocals. Studded with unforgettable stories, characters and a strong roster of songs led by one of his very finest in wide lovely eyes. Cave casts a wry eye over proceedings, reducing the ills of the world to Miley Cyrus in his swimming pool in the massive Higgs boson blues, and Wikipedia seeming to supplant God as the governing centre of the universe. But he's outside all of this. In Higgs Boson, he's a vision seeing Dylan shuffling back and forth in time. And in We Real Cool, he places us and our earthly wiki works squarely in perspective. Information is a fingertip away, but our universe is still incomprehensibly vast. 
It may not be what the long-term fans value, but this is Nick Cave at his best, his most lyrical, and his most valuable as an artist. Number two, The Firstborn is Dead from 1985. The first time I encountered Nick Cave was in late 1985 when I used to have license to root through a guy who played bass in a band called The Karens Record Collection and he threw mine. And I came away with Cave, Tom Waits and an album by The Cult. And the album that took me was The Firstborn is Dead. Dramatic, literate, imaginative, blood-soaked and horrifying. It was like nothing I'd ever heard and I have never heard anything like it since. The opening Tupelo recasts the John Lee Hooker Blues as the apocalypse, infusing it with Presley and iconography. Knockin' on Joe and Blind Lemon Jefferson both wallow in and reinvent the Delta Blues mentality. It's still an album that I find great zest and energy and inspiration in, and to me, this is my source voice for Nick Cave. Number one, Skeleton Tree from 2016. The follow-up to push the sky away, rather than the first response to Arthur's death, the lyrics were largely written in sequence when Arthur passed on and only subject to some last minute adjustment and improvisation, particularly on the opening track. This is a natural musical progression from Push the Sky Away. Aurora, more lo-fi, dissonant, noisy, and one requiring more of Cave as a vocalist to sing melody in frequently contrary time signatures to the music. It verges on avant-garde music. It also sees Cave abandoning his narrative style. It's confronting to hear the album open with, you fell from the sky, crash landed in a field near the river Ada. Rings of satin, girl in amber, Anthracene and distant sky with this astonishing ambition that they told us our gods would outlive us but they lied are all utterly superior songs and the plaintive title track resolves the album perfectly. Skeleton Tree is stripping away the mythology that surrounds it. Kay's most musically challenging album, his most lyrically significant album given the change from narrative to personal observational styles and his most honest and confronting record and for an artist whose hallmark is his honesty and his ability to confront things within ourselves that makes it a very important record in this catalogue. There we have it, one of the most fascinating and challenging catalogues in the entirety of the classic canon, picked through and reviewed to the best of my capability. I hope that you found it interesting and that it piqued your curiosity and that I was able to be of some service in helping you decide whether to and where you might enter that catalogue. All that remains now to be said is to thank you for stopping by and to express the fervent hope that the next time we're gathered together in good company, provided the nasty YouTube police don't shut the channel down, that we shall meet again.